warship. This is Marlin Luanda. We are hit by a missile. We are hit by a missile. We are on fire. We are on fire. Starboard side deck is on fire. On today's episode of What's Going On with Shipping, the Houthi have struck a tanker in the Gulf of Aden. I'm your host, Sal Cagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So the Houthi have been talking about and trying very hard to inflict significant damage on a vessel, and that has happened. The Marshall Island flag tanker Marlin Luanda, which is owned by a UK company and through a, a subsidiary in Luxembourg and a really convoluted amount of organization here, was hit south of Yemen in the Gulf of Aden, a 110,000-ton product tanker carrying 91,000 tons of naphtha, a very highly flammable uh, petroleum-based liquid that's used in refining. We're going to look at this story, and more importantly, we're going to look at the efforts to save the vessel, the response by the crew, and navies in the area. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So these were some of the first images we had of the vessel uh, and its fire on board. The ship reported being struck in the number five hold on the starboard side. So if you look at the vessel from this perspective, the bow is to the right, the stern is to the left. And that fire does appear to be right around the number five hold. Number one hold will be all the way forward, and the ship will probably have about seven or eight cargo holds and then there would also be a, a divert a, a division of tanks with two wing tanks and a center line tank and they reported they were hit in the number five starboard tank much better image here very dramatic image of the fire on board looks extremely bad at this point now something to understand about product tankers which this ship is the ship will carry product within the segregated holds and within the holds the ship uses exhaust from its engine to create an inert atmosphere so that combustion and fire cannot happen. Basically, they fill the compartment, they reduce the oxygen level down to about 8%, so there's not enough oxygen to support combustion. What has obviously happened here is the missile strike has penetrated into the tank, added heat, and now with the tank compromised, air can get in, there's no longer the inert atmosphere, and you have a fire that's raging on board. This image taken from the bridge looks down on the tanker and you can see looking forward the starboard side, the right side of the vessel, where the fire is. This image here is zoomed in just a minute, just a bit. And if you look in the middle of the vessel or the left side here, these are the piping for the individual tanks. So a very complex array of pipes so that you can move cargo to and from the vessel. You'll also see the fire emerging here very large flame what we see is a penetration of the deck on the starboard side that has opened up the explosion of probably not the warhead and i'll come back to that in a minute was enough to ignite the uh, nap that we see it ignited it's burning through the deck there through an open hole and then you'll see some monitors monitors are fire monitors these are uncrewed water cannons that are shooting onto the deck they're shooting a mixture of water and foam actually because you can see the foam accumulating along the starboard rail of the vessel and you want to use foam principally because what the foam does besides cooling the fire it creates a blanket and what you want to do is separate the product the naphtha from the air and so you would always try to use uh, foam and you'll see it being used extensively later in this fire a much more dramatic photo here of the fire. You get an impression of the heat. So obviously you want to use these un uncrewed monitors to spray into them. They're spraying here kind of on the deck, trying to push that foam into uh, the hold where the fire is. The problem you have, obviously, is the heat is going to be evaporating it almost as quickly as you're spraying it on there. You've got to get a lot of volume on the fire. Big fire means big water. And you've got to get a lot on there to be able to douse it. Now, the fear here, if you are a crew member, obviously, is that while you have inert gas compartments forward, aft, and to the port side of this vessel, th heat's going to radiate through the steel. And it's going to start heating up the naphtha in the other compartments. And when you start heating it up, you can start boiling it, in which case you're increasing the volume and pressure in those compartments. And you may have a rupture. You may blow out vents or uh, piping. And if you start venting multiple compartments, multiple holds, then those can ignite and catch fire. So a very precarious situation for the ship and the crew. The crew is reported by uh, 
press in India as being 22 Indian crew members and one Bangladesh. Here we have the morning, the fire still burning on board, still localized, but to that number five starboard hold, which is a good indication. The fire has not spread. The fear here is that other compartments would be involved, other areas of the ship. But right now that fire seems to be contained and not as severe and robust as you saw in earlier images. Here's an image of the crew looking to evacuate the vessel. Now, they probably didn't evacuate the entire crew, but there's no reason to keep the entire crew on board just in case. You'd want to keep an engineering crew on board, a bridge crew on board, and then a firefighting teams on board. And they're probably being reinforced by other naval craft. You can see alongside a small rib boat, a rigid hull inflatable boat. You can see a Jacob's ladder or a pilot's ladder down below where the lifeboat is. It's, it's important to note that they didn't launch the lifeboats. Uh, it wasn't necessary. There were other craft in the area, so they were able to have assistance. And the Indian Navy, in particularly the uh, Indian d destroyer uh, Visa Shak Put Putnam. Uh, I'm not sure I'm saying that right. I apologize. Uh, I will try to get it right. Visa Shak Putnam was on hand, close by, sailed from Djibouti, and at a very rapid speed closed the area to provide assistance, principally because not only is the ship in distress, but a very large Indian crew on board. Here you see more rescue operations in place, a rib boat, this time on the opposite side of the vessel. This is on the port side of the vessel. Uh, lines being thrown down to them. They may be moving equipment up to assist, maybe foam, maybe firefighting equipment. Uh, not really clear from that image. The fortunate thing is it's very calm that day. There was very little wind going on, and the seas and swells were pretty flat here. Get a better image here from a stern of Marlon Longa. You can see that uh, the ship has got a bit of a list to starboard. In other words, the port side, the left side of the vessel, is a little higher than the right side of the vessel. That's actually a good thing because you kind of want to push the, the product into those hold and kind of get it down in there. So if you're spraying, you want to kind of make sure it's going down into the hole. Fire still seems to be fairly localized at this point. And then this image, again, is from that Indian destroyer, the, the Visa Shock Putnam. Uh, you can see the fire burning in the distance. Uh, India has been very quick to react. We've seen the Indian Navy come out in full force because of attacks on vessels that have Indian crews. There are, there are five nations that provide really the bulk of seamen and mariners out there. Philippines is, is number one, but India is a close one right behind it. China, Indonesia, and Russia are the other major ones that provide that uh, cruise for these vessels. So this is a great video that was posted by the Indian Navy, and you can see firefighting efforts taking place here. Now, notice they're not using the fire monitors here. They are using uh, the ship's, uh, they're using hoses. Now, I'm not exactly sure if these are being powered off the ship's uh, Fire pumps, probably so. There was no reason for the ship to lose power. The, the engine compartment uh, was fine. So probably pumping uh, from uh, the ship's fire mains up into this. Uh, probably two and a half inch lines. You want big water on this fire. Notice the white foam here that's spraying down off the side. This is that uh, AFFF aqueous film forming foam spraying it right down into the hold trying to get it you're getting some black smoke but not a tremendous amount of black smoke off this that means naphtha is burning very complete notice a little bit down here again you're looking at this image of the fire this is the starboard side of the vessel so again the bridge and the engine room will be to your left the bow would be to your right but notice the fact that paint have come off here on the hull and the distortion of color on the crane uh, to the right that gives you an impression of how hot this fire was a definitely a significant amount of heat emanating from it the other thing that's really stands out for me is it appears that this warhead, the missile itself, plunged down into the hold from above. If you saw one of my last videos, which talked about the attack on the Zagrafia, which was a bulk carrier, that ship was struck by a missile at about a 45 degree angle. It came into the number two hold, and then the missile pr proceeded onward and actually popped out through the starboard side. And what we saw for a detonation was actually the missile field detonating. The warhead itself went through the side. Notice on the starboard side of Marlin Luanda, we don't see an exit wound. So that means that this warhead or this missile plunged into the vessel 
And if the warhead didn't detonate, which I'm not 100% sure the warhead did detonate, because we don't see a lot of structural damage here. We don't see the plates bulged out. We don't see steel ripped apart. What we basically have is a hole. Probably what happened is the warhead didn't detonate, but the fuel detonated from the missile, meaning that down at the bottom of the f number five starboard tank in Napa, maybe a warhead. So definitely a concern looking forward. But the good thing is the crew was able, alongside with support from the Indian Navy, to get the fire out. Here's a subsequent image showing the fire extinguished. You can see the crews right up on the hole right now, spraying down into the compartment. They will fill that up with foam. They want to cool it down and make sure that there's no chance of a reflash or a rewatch. They'll have to watch it because, again, the compartment is now open to the air, so the inert atmosphere is gone. So you really want to remove the heat from the area, but an amazing amount of work done by the crew on board Marlon Luanda. Again, a very small crew. You're talking about 23 people, 22 people on board, really small crew. The Indian Navy responding. We also saw the response of the U.S. Navy, USS Kearney, a destroyer that's been out there doing yeoman work. Fantastic job. And then we saw a French frigate arrive too, the Alsace arrived on scene. And all those vessels provided a lot of assistance to the ship as it transpired. So this is a statement from the operating company, uh, Trafurgia. Again, names are going to kill me. I apologize. Don't mean to disrespect a name here. But their statement, and first off, kudos for this company. They were really good in providing updates uh, very regularly. And so this is a statement out at 1200 GMT on 27 January. Please confirm that all the crew on board Marlin Luanda are safe and the fire in the cargo tank has been fully extinguished. The vessel is now sailing towards a safe harbor. The crew continues to monitor the vessel and cargo closely, so whatever crew had been evacuated were returned. We would like to recognize the exceptional dedication and bravery of the ship's master and crew who managed to control the fire in a highly difficult circumstances. Exactly true. Very small crews on these vessels. And for the fact that I'm not to panic, to, to be very level-headed and try to get extinguishment on there, get fire, you know, get fire foam on there, really great job as well as the essential assistance provided by the Indian, U.S., and French Navy vessels to achieve the outcome. No further vessels operating on behalf of Trafagir, are, Trafagir I, can't, I don't know how to say this, are currently transiting the Gulf of Aden, and we continue to assess carefully the risks involved in any voyage, including in respect of the security and safety of the crew, together with ship owners and customers. All right, I want to take you over to marine traffic and show you a couple of things here. So I cleaned up marine traffic just a bit here because I want to show you a couple of key elements of the ships coming into the area. So this is marine traffic. I uh, cleaned it up. I removed all other vessels except for a few key ones here. So you'll see Marlin Luanda coming in through the Northern Red Sea. It's right there through the narrowest channel right now in the Bab El Mandab. Oh, cheers. Just in front of it is another tanker, the Achilles. They're both coming in. They just passed Param Island and heading into the Gulf of Aden. Down in Djibouti is an Indian warship. This is the Visa Shock Putnam. It is pierside or at anchor there in Djibouti at this moment. And then off the coast of, of Djibouti is the Bashad. And Bashad is that uh, Iranian spy ship that we keep talking about. It was up in the Southern Red Sea, when you had the January 9 convoy battle when the four American ships came by, it got underway and was steaming back and forth in the narrowest part of the Southern Red Sea. And uh, we also saw it sitting right here when the most recent attack took place on Maersk Chesapeake and Maersk Detroit, when those vessels came through the Gulf of Aden trying to head up and had to turn around. So here you see uh, Marlon Luanda and the uh, Achilles coming through the area. So fast forward a little bit, just moved it down a little bit. At this point, uh, Marlon Luanda is overtaking Achilles. Now they're in a traffic separation scheme. I don't have the nautical chart superimposed on here because it makes it very uh, kind of confusing. But a couple of things to note. Number one, Bashad. Bashad, which was steaming back and forth, and if you run its track back for the past few days, it was running like a knot or two, just heading back gets underway at a little more speed than what we've seen, about four to five knots, and starts heading out. Now, this is daylight. We're looking here. This is right around 0800 UTC time. That's about 1000 local time. You're looking at a distance here of the closest point of approach of these vessels is probably about 20, 30 miles. So visual distance kind of tough at that far. You can, you know, again, that's a pretty far reach on visual 
But we don't know what Bashad has, if they have small boats, if they have drones that they can launch so they can monitor the area. And what we think Bashad is doing is IDing vessels and communicating that to the Houthi because ships can spoof their AIS, in other words, give false reports, they can turn them off. But Marlon uh, Luanda is, is an interesting one because, again, it is linked to a UK company. And this has been something that the uh, um, Houthi have been saying is that they're going to target not just Israeli vessels, but US and UK vessels. Now, what's even more interesting about Marlon Luanda is, yeah, while it's linked to a U UK company, and again, very convoluted, through a Luxembourg holding company that's managed by JP Morgan, uh, Marshall Island flagged with an Indian crew. The ship loaded Russian naphtha. Uh, what is it is sat for a couple of weeks up in an anchorage south of Greece, where smaller tankers come out of the Black Sea, Russian tankers, and load up these larger tankers. Uh, again, Marlin Luanda is about a hundred and ten thousand ton tanker. It's got ninety one thousand tons of naphtha on board, and about three Russian tankers came out through the Black Sea to the anchorage south of of Greece, just west of Crete and loaded this ship up. Now, this is not a legal trade. This is not the dark trade. The naphtha was below the price cap, so this is not an illegal trade. The ship is showing its destination as Singapore, but probably heading out into uh, East Asia. This uh, cargo of naphtha is usually used in refining to mix with oil, so a vital component here for the refining process. And so we've seen a lot of Russian oil coming through, and we knew that Russian oil has been coming through the Suez. Now, this vessel is not a cheap vessel. It's a product tanker. It's not a crude oil tanker. It's a product tanker. And uh, Marine Traffic had the vessel valued at about $60 million. It's a six-year-old tanker. Not exactly sure it would be that much in value, but the cargo, 90,000 tons of naphtha. Naphtha runs about $600 a ton. So you're, you're looking at a ship probably valued at about $100 million, at least with cargo. And when you look at the fact that war risk insurance is running about 1%, uh, this ship, uh, to pay its war risk insurance, would have to pay a $1 million to come out. And so uh, this is going to be a big question going forward because the damage done to this vessel is a heck of a lot more than a $1 million. And insurance companies don't like to pay out uh, that amount of money. It's also at this point that the Indian warship, uh, the Vaishak Putnam, comes underway from Djibouti. Now, I don't know if that's related to this or not. It could be a scheduled departure. It's not heading out very urgently, or it may be getting underway because it's watching the Bashar. We don't know. Also, we don't have AIS data on American and French uh, vessels that are in the area because they don't like to uh, use them. Here you see Marlin Luanda making the turn. It's turning from a course of roughly east-southeast, heading to a course now of uh, north, uh, uh, east by north, uh, or north-northeast, excuse me, heading that way. And Bashad is, is still kind of, not paralleling it, but definitely following it a bit. And Achilles is right behind it. So I'm going to move this up here just a little bit here as we go and watch this. So what we know from the UK's Maritime Trade uh, Operations Office is that Mar Marlin Luanda reports a missile strike, but also multiple other missiles in and around the area. And you'll see the vessel is steaming at about 14 knots right now. You're going to see the vessel come off its speed uh, very quickly when all of a sudden it believes, that, uh, or when it's struck. Uh, you don't want to keep sailing at full speed because you're fanning the flames. What you want to do is slow down uh, so that you can get in there and fight the fire. And if you're fighting wind and flames, that's a, a big problem uh, when you do that. And this is the moment here where we start seeing the vessel start to slow down. And when you see it slow down, that's good indication of the missile strike. Right around 1,700 hours UTC time, roughly around 1,900 hours UTC time, when I played the distress signal at the very beginning of this video, got that off Facebook from a Filipino mariner who recorded it. You can actually go into a database and determine where uh, communications are from and the time they're originated. And looking at that database, uh, we saw a distress call come out from Marlin Luanda on very high frequency VHF channel 16. So that kind of corresponds. Here you see Luanda kind of slowing down, coming to almost a, a complete stop at this point. Achilles is going to move into the area here and provide assistance. Uh, we definitely see her move in. We initially thought she might have been struck, but instead she just slows down and provides assistance. And in the meantime, the Indian warship 
puts the hammers down, gets up to about 25 knots, and proceeds to provide assistance. So Achilles does what they're supposed to do under Solus, safety of life at sea. You're supposed to stop and render aid. They do. The Indian warship hits its hammers, comes down, and will proceed and eventually provide aid. In the meantime, Bashad is kind of sailing out of that area and moving away. And you see you lose the uh, report there from uh, uh, Marlon Luanda at this point. So we've already seen a reduction of about 30% of the total number of ships going through that region. Uh, we're seeing a reduction of over 50% in terms of tonnage. But the ships that have been leaving are those high war risk insurance ships, the ships with a very high insurance value. Well, now I'm going to say product tankers are probably not going to be coming through anymore. That's going to leave basically bulk, tank, uh, bulk carriers, which tend to be very low value and maybe crude oil tankers, and that may be it, along with some ships that are, 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 are working in the region. Uh, smaller container ships of, of companies like GFS and, and, and uh, UASC, uh, these, these are small shipping lines that operate in and around the area, but I don't think you're gonna see a lot of very high value targets, and I'm, I'm not sure you're gonna see the container lines run even a few of their big ships through with a lot of escorts because there is a lot of fear. The problem you have is that the Houthi, even though they have been hit and hit hard by the United States and the UK, it's very hard to eliminate any potential missile threat. And what we saw here is if you keep shooting them, if you give me a shot, you know, you tell me there's a chance, well, the chance is you're gonna hit and you did hit. And we're just fortunate that the ship was saved and the crew escaped uh, any serious injury, which I think is, is just tremendous. Uh, a fortunate piece of luck. I think the other element we have to start looking at here is get some salvage elements into this area. If we're going to keep sailing ships through, we're going to need firefighting boats, we're going to need salvage tugs, uh, because something bad is going to eventually happen if this continues. How does this end? Man, that's a really tough question. We saw that China is trying to exert some leadership here and maybe put some pressure on the Houthis. The problem is, again, the whole underlying issue here is, is Israel and Gaza. It's the Hamas attack out of Gaza on October 7th and now Israel's response. And until you have Midi's peace, the Houthi are ideological. They're going to keep attacking, which means that it's very hard to leverage the Houthi. But the Chinese do have leverage, and that's the Iranians. And the question is, can the Chinese leverage the Iranians? The other variable in this whole equation was the group that made their appearance here, and that's the Indian Navy. The Indian Navy has been out here in force, and the Indian Navy is trying to protect its mariners. And there is no telling what the Indian Navy will do. Indian Navy is very capable, extremely capable Navy, very large military. And India is suffering really hard because of these inability to get through that region to the Suez Canal because India trades extensively with Europe. And if it can't get its goods that way, it's going to go all the way around Africa. And for India, that almost, almost triples the distance or quadruples in some cases, the distance involved. And so India has a big play. Remember, big Navy, big Army, nuclear power. They, they are not a small player in the world stage. And again, the other problem you have here, too, is the U.S. Navy is just being hamstrung in this operation. We have four destroyers out there, Gravely, Laboon, uh, Mason, and uh, Kearney. That's it. That, four destroyers. We have 70 something Burke class destroyers, 70 something Burke class destroyers, and yet we have four out there. I, I mean, it's not even 10% of the U.S. destroyer fleet. And understand those destroyers, along with the Type 45, the Diamond from the Royal Navy, has to provide the gatekeeper. They have to be stationed between Yemen and the shipping channel to catch these missiles when they get launched. Uh, there's not enough vessels to provide direct escort. Uh, you can't organize convoys. That's not going to this going to work. There's there's 40, 50 ships coming through a day. Really tough to do that. Uh, and the U.S. Navy is you know if you pull a U.S. Navy vessel off to escort someone like they it's like we talked about in the video about Maersk Chesapeake and Maersk Detroit, that's not going to happen because then you leave a hole in the fence, and it opens up the way for the Houthi to launch more attacks. We are doing this kind of on a shoestring. It doesn't get a lot of visibility. It really doesn't. And the fear here is that Eisenhower will withdraw and go up to the Mediterranean eventually. Now, you may move another carrier in, the Vincent or the Theodore Roosevelt, from the Western Pacific because you need that air power. You need the F-18s. But more importantly, you need the E-2 Hawkeyes with their radar and their look-down capability. You need the helicopters. 
Uh, you have a drone base in Djibouti where you have some surveillance. You have military bases where Air Force aircraft fly out of in Qatar and UAE. But that's a bit of a haul to get across. Plus, you get to fly across Saudi Arabia or long distance uh, uh, over the water. So it, it, it's really difficult right now to maintain a forward presence. And the fear here is that this attack, along with subsequent attacks, will convince more and more shipping not to sail through this area, sending them around Africa, and that further will raise the cost to ship goods. Understand, container ships, we can kind of suck it up. If you look at what's happening to the freight rates right now in container ships, they're plateauing. They're getting to the level, and they're kind of flattening out. Product tankers, crude oil tankers, we don't have enough. They haven't been building them because the market's been terrible, and you only build ships when you have cash in hand. So the tankers and product tankers, if they have to go around Africa, we don't have them. And we have phased out the really big ones, the VLCCs and ULCCs, the very large and ultra-large crude carriers. They've been basically gotten rid of because they're too big and they can only go in certain ports. We've, got, we've much more developed ships, kind of like what you see with uh, Marlin uh, Luanda, a LR2 uh, Suez Max vessel, 100, 110,000 deadweight tons, can go through the Suez, carry the max amount. Those are the type of ships that are really sought after, but LRs and the smaller versions of them, MRs, long-range, medium-range tankers, that's what the acronym stands for, they're in short supply. And if all of a sudden you have to increase ton miles, the amount of distance you have to travel a ton of cargo, that's going to be a big problem when it comes to petroleum. Add to it that LNG, liquefied natural gas, is already going around that route. There are issues in the Panama Canal with only two-thirds of the number of ships able to get through. We have some serious concerns right now that this attack by the Houthi, although it did not sink Marlin Luanda, may be the one moment here where we start seeing shipping companies start looking, especially if all of a sudden the war, the war risk committee decides that war risk has to go up and all of a sudden those insurance rates start to climb. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Well, you can hit the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon where you become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Until our next video or the next time the Houthi bombs someone, which unfortunately I think may be sooner rather than later, this is Sal signing off.